Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Stefan, and I'm here with Brendan. Hello, Brendan. Hey, so we, we are going to have a nice chat about Kubernetes in 2023 and see where Kubernetes is and what its future and how you can take the best out of it and, you know, build your own platform. Yep. Pretty excited to, to talk about it in the ninth, the ninth year of Kubernetes. It's amazing to, uh, to be thinking about that. So where are we at um, in 2023? You know, I think that the thing is that, that Kubernetes is now mainstream. It's not even, you know, in the mid adopter phase, it's in the late adopter phase. Um, and, and it's really become the industry standard um, for running cloud native applications anywhere. So, you know, Stefan, what are you seeing and the reasons why people are choosing Kubernetes? Well, the reason I'm choosing Kubernetes, um, besides anything else, it's, it's community. Uh, I'm really amazed at what the uh, community has built around Kubernetes. Its whole ecosystem is, is really great. I'm, I feel very proud to be part of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to choose Kubernetes, you have so many reasons. And I think one of the major reason uh, today is the fact that the managed services of the cloud vendors out there are uh, offering a mature Kubernetes uh, as a service. And I think that it's quite critical for Kubernetes adoption given the fact that you know kubernetes is so complex and it's really hard to set it up well uh, if you can do it uh, with a click of a button then you know you can really focus on what's really important is you know uh, create this continuous delivery ideal pipeline so all your apps get uh, deployed instantly and all your customers are happy yeah for sure i mean i think that the interesting thing is i think at this point um we might not even say customers are choosing Kubernetes. Um, I think you'd say even that they're just assuming Kubernetes, right? And you're, I think you're seeing this all over in all sorts of, whether it's in AI or um, any other uh, databases. Um, a lot of people who are building ISVs who are building software, they're just assuming that you have managed Kubernetes available to you. And I think it's a huge lift as well um, in terms of people can kind of forget about how do you manage machines? How do you deploy software? They can rely on this infrastructure and then innovate on top of that. And that's a, a another big part of the ecosystem, I think, is that innovation. Um, and speaking of that sort of stuff, I think what the truth is when we look at our uh, developers out there, what we're really seeing is that Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. Uh, and so it's the base, it's the foundation, but it's not where a lot of people uh, stop because you know raw Kubernetes by itself, the basic objects that are in there are a little bit like machine code, um, and they're often too complicated um, for application development. Or in some cases, it's just because the Kubernetes community proactively decided, you know, that's not a problem we're going to solve. We're going to defer to the to the ecosystem um, out there to solve it. So, Savan, what are you seeing in terms of like eco ecosystem projects that um, that complement Kubernetes? Yeah, what about vendor lock-in? I mean, when, when Kubernetes started, right, the, uh, the main idea is it will uh, get rid of vendor lock-in and you'll be free of it and you can move from any cloud to any cloud, from any data center to any data center. Did we end up <laughs> with this promise or it's more nuanced? Yeah, I think it's way more nuanced. I mean, I think that... Um... You know, I think we see this out here with various enterprises who've said, like, we're going to be uh, building an application platform no matter where we go, and our developers will just see the application platform, um, and it won't matter, you know, which public cloud they're going to. And I think it's a great, it's a great vision, um, but it takes a ton of discipline, right? And I think that um, what we're interest, what we're seeing interestingly enough is that um, really it's the value of of consistent tooling and not having to re educate your developers in different ways of deploying software into different places that is the real win. It's not sort of, I mean, I, I sort of draw a comparison to the Java promise of like write once, run anywhere, which was really more like write once, debug everywhere. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, so I say, I don't, I don't think you know, we want to sell people on the vision of like, well, there's perfect portability, but I do think that there's skills transfer 
meaning you can have one set of CI CD, you can have one set of, uh, you know, developer tooling, code review, all of that kind of stuff, and have it that skill set be portable. Um, and I think also getting back to that ecosystem thing, um, there's a real opportunity to hire people uh, with the skills immediately valuable to your application platform, even if you know they come from a different company or even uh, you know a, a different academic environment. Um, and I think that consistent app deployment is something that um, is a real value proposition. Yeah, me as a Flux maintainer, I'm I'm interacting all the time with Kubernetes from an API perspective. So um, I'm, from my point of view, the real strength of Kubernetes is that no matter where it runs, if it's Azure, AWS, whatever, the API is the same, and I have the same, you know, guarantees. Uh, if I want to look at the application, is it healthy? There is a deployment object, it has a status conditions and so on. So I have that consistency of uh, at least saying, is it running or not? Or do I want to do something with it? And I don't have to change the, um, let's say the operations uh, to perform a rollout, even if, you know, maybe I have to change an ingress controller or I have to change the load balancer implementation every time I'm moving from one cloud to another but there are so many other things around the application lifecycle which is very consistent even if you know uh, i'm moving from from one platform to another and i think if something will live on from kubernetes uh, many years to go it it's the idea behind its api and how how these things are 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 uh, mixed together, like how a service relates to a deployment, how a deployment relates to a pod and so on. These kind of concepts are, in, in my opinion, are way better than thinking around machines and processes. Um, so yeah. that's yeah, that's a sure. great step forward, in, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we always thought of it as being developer-oriented APIs instead of infrastructure-oriented APIs. Um, and I think also that ability that you talked about for that for the ecosystem to um, build a single set of tools on top is a huge win too, right? We don't want to have we wouldn't have a great ecosystem if if Flux didn't work with Kubernetes everywhere, right? If you had to be like this is the Azure Flux thing and this is the AWS Flux, like it just wouldn't work, right? So that consistent API, even if apps aren't perfectly portable, that consistent API enables these shared projects right these projects that the whole world can come and rally around um, and i think what's really great actually is also in doing that um we've also gone along and we've we've enabled people to forget about problems right so so i actually don't know St stefan when you um started in the industry but like when i started in the industry figuring out how you shipped your code out to a server in the data center like that was a problem you had to solve. Like, am I going to use a tarball? Am I going to use, you know, an MSI? Am I going to use like, how am I going to install? Like there were companies actually that like were about how you installed software. Um, and I think now we've gotten to a place where with the container registry API, with a Docker file to declaratively describe your infrastructure, um, you know, it's just a consistent way of doing that, that everybody knows and that we can rally tools around, right? So you can do image scanning, on a specific image format, you can do uh, all kinds of different stuff in a consistent way. And similarly, like we've taken the idea of how do you do a deployment, right? And we've turned it into code that you that everybody can use, as opposed to maybe a checklist that somebody wrote down or just tribal knowledge that people were like, okay, this is the right way to do a zero downtime deployment. Um, and I think that's really huge in terms of making everybody's lives better and easier. Is enabling most people to not think about it and then also enabling us as a community to come together and produce a single best practices implementation as opposed to like hacky scripts left all over the place um but we've promised a lot on this slide so um you know do you think it actually can be this simple right like are we are we overselling this or uh, what are what are the complex how does the complexity come in yeah, I think the complexity comes in when you're not a single developer. <laughs> you don't have a single Git repo and it's just one app. Um, more people have to collaborate on it. Uh, and in 
you know, it's not just a Kubernetes deployment. You need, you know, policies around it. You need horizontal pod autoscalers. You need an ingress. You need all these things. And that idea that, okay, it's Kubernetes is declarative. You can get away with a Docker file, uh, a deployment.yaml, and a GitHub workflow in your repo. And you can actually, you know, make this all work with a Kubernetes as a service, let's say uh, AKS and GitHub Actions. It's a great combination to deploy a simple app, but when you get to many teams, many applications, maybe the application is, you know, uh, made out of many microservices. So you have so many repos and so on. It's, it's quite hard to maintain that simple workflow that you've started with. So one, one solution that uh, me and uh, the other Flux maintainers, we are working on for, I don't know, five years now, uh, almost six, is the idea of how you can, you know, um, take advantage of the declarative nature of, of Kubernetes and allow a more streamlined continuous delivery pipeline, something that works at scale. So you can, for example, you start with two cluster staging and production, right? Then you realize, oh, I cannot have a single production cluster because now my clients, for example, are not only in Europe, they are also in Asia or US. So I have to, you know, uh, get the application closer to them. So in, in, in the original, in the legacy pipeline, let's call it right, when you do everything from a, a single CI job, every time you add a new cluster, you have to, you know, put the secret there, make the CI job be aware of that cluster, there is a lot of work and yep. it's quite dangerous because when you keep all things in a single place, we, we've seen so many issues starting a couple of years ago with attacks on especially CI uh, yep. uh, instances. So in order to make this story better, what our idea was to make the clusters look at the desired state then having the CI process go to the cluster and tell the cluster with a kubectl apply or kubectl delete or whatever Helm install or whatever command you're running. Instead of doing that imperative thing where you connect to the cluster and tell the cluster, hey, now deploy my app. If the cluster should look somewhere, it can be a Git repo or more of those, and see if there is a change in the desired state. Oh, the container image has changed. So I have to roll out a new version of the application. You don't have to connect to the cluster and tell, hey, now run this new version. The cluster itself uh, through uh, controller extensions and Flux is just an extension of the Kubernetes API. And there are other uh, solutions out there that they are doing the same thing, Argo CD as well uh, in CNCF. So the idea is basically you add a new cluster and that cluster knows from start that it needs to reach a, a certain desired state. It needs to install add-ons, it needs to deploy applications and so on without you having and telling him exactly what it needs to do. I think that's, yeah. it's not a solution, uh, you know, that all of the sudden will make you scale infinitely, but it's a good step forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the interesting things that we've also seen uh, is how you the, see the GitHub story. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I, yeah. you know, I think one of the other interesting things that we've seen is that, um, it enables you to really have a cluster that's locked down from a security perspective, right? Because if you're if you have an agent that's inside the cluster reaching out to get to find out its new desired state and then adjusting the APIs inside the cluster, um, the number of times you need external users to then go in and reach into that cluster and make changes is actually quite small. It's just, you know, maybe if there's a live site or a, a problem where you need somebody to come in and debug a problem. Um, and so that means that, like, for example, when you use an AKS cluster with uh, Active Directory, we set it up, um, you know, we our recommended production setup would be that you have a group that has no members in it that has access to the, the production cluster, right? So by default, nobody has access to the cluster most of the time. Um, and then only in a just-in-time way, you add users into that group, you know, just for a period of time, a time bound, you know, like eight hours. Um, and actually, AAD will rip them out, automatically remove them um, after that time bound. And, and GitOps makes that possible, right? Because if you are using traditional CI/CD, as as Stefan said, um, 
you have to keep that credential in a different place. And then you also have that robot um, or that agent, wherever it is, that's continuously making API calls into your cluster. So you need to put it on usually on the public internet um, and you need to have that inbound access available to that robot. Um, and so I think GitOps not only makes it easier to scale and add new clusters, but it actually also like enables you to have a more secure footprint um, by default inside your clusters. Uh, so I think it's a, a cool benefit. And of course, also, I would say the other thing we see, especially out to the edge, um, you know, people, you, you mean, we have three clusters here and maybe that's typical for an internet service, but we see retailers who have thousands of Kubernetes clusters in retail environments. And there's just no way they're going to manage that from a CI CD, um, both because of the scale, but also because of the intermittent connectivity, right? The reversing of the connection from being a uh, push into the cluster to being a pull down from the cluster means that if that cluster has intermittent connectivity, it still works, right? The flux agent will try for a while and then it'll fail. And then eventually you'll get connectivity. It'll talk to the Git repo and it'll adjust things as opposed to like your entire pipeline crashing to a halt because you couldn't, you know, do a cube control apply onto a particular cluster at a particular time. So I think there's a lot of benefits from that reversing of the uh, of the flow. Yeah, one, so one we, thing. Uh, yeah, go for it. One more thing I wanted to say here is around uh, drift correction. Is like w when you adopt GitOps, you should, in a way, be comfortable with the idea that you shouldn't be going into a cluster and doing edits all of the sudden, right? And what Flux tries really hard to do is undo all the edits when it discovers it, report it, hey, someone, something has changed the state outside of my knowledge, and I will try to revert it to the last desired state. And it, in this way, you have something to fight with during incidents, right? So uh, that's why we, we have this command on how you can pause it for a particular uh, time so you can get in there and, and you know, debug and, and, and resolve the things. But I think it's a, what what we are trying to encourage users is if you want to change something, do it uh, declaratively, and your whole team should be aware of the change, right? Because it's also collab it has a collaboration aspect to it. You should open up a request. Someone from your team should you know approve some change, and only then that config uh, change will actually be you know uh, rolled out across the cluster fleet, and yeah. um, it's. it's it's a hard change in terms of, uh, you know, yeah, how you I'll, I'll also say that I think there's, I mean, I've seen outages caused by uh, people going in, fixing stuff manually, and then forgetting to move the fix into version control. And then the next rollout comes along and it overwrites the whatever the fix was, right? And so you actually have the same outage twice effectively. Um, <laughs> And so I, I totally think that getting people into that mindset of everything has to be checked in, even live site fixes. I mean, every once in a while there's an emergency, but more often than not, um, you want to go through the standard rollout procedure, even for a live site fix. So, of course. Um, so like we talked a lot about the GitOps, um, which is kind of a general way of deploying and configuring your um, your cluster but what are the you know what do you think the ideal cloud native platform what are the pieces that people should be thinking about when they're building that cloud native platform yeah so i used to think GitOps is the platform right uh, until i've talked to many many flux users which are telling me hey not everybody's cloud native savvy in our teams not everybody's technical not everybody can even, you know, get into Git and do a commit, <laughs> open a pull request and so on. There are so many people which are part of the delivery process, which are not technical. So I think uh, the ideal cloud native platform should allow all people that are part of the delivery and maintenance and, you know, um, what it really means to ship a product to uh, to clients, all these people should be able to collaborate on, on this uh, platform. So this platform has to, in a way, abstract things out and make them obvious. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wrote here, it is for everybody. 
I think it it should be the the driving force behind building a platform. Uh, of course, standardization. Uh, if you have uh, Node.js, you have 10 Node.js app and every single app has a different Docker file, a different Helm chart, a different way of, you know, writing logs or, or, or stuff like that. It's, it's not going to scale because then you, you can't just create a runbook. How I fix Node.js apps? Every single app yeah, is yeah. a little bit different, right? So standardization, it's, it's great around that. And it's not only about tooling, how you build the app and so on. It's all, also about practices. Uh, I think the standardization should be starting with the practices and then going back to the tooling and decide which tooling should we use based on what our practices and all. Yeah. Yeah, uh, get into that. Uh... I think it's always a challenge too, because people are like, "Well, but this is my favorite tool over here." And I think that sometimes you just have to tell people like, the standardization is worth more than you getting to use your favorite tool, right? Like, I, and I, that's a hard lesson I think for engineers to learn at some level. Like, um, but at scale in large companies, there's just so much value that you get out of that consistency. Um, and uh, and even for people who know what they're doing, right? And I totally agree with you. Like a large number of, of people, it's they just want to get their job done. They just want to write some code, check it in. Magic happens. It's deployed. And um, that's goodness, right? Um, but even for the people who want to be down in the cloud native space, like you have to at some point be like, you don't get to choose which version of Node you run, right? Like there's one version of Node.js for our company. Um, and and that's it's this is I think how the platforms are how you get there. Um, yeah, it's also about flexibility, right? At at some point, you have to allow something to fine tune something around their application, but you can't do that as, at the detriment of security and policy, right? You can't allow people to say, oh, I'm disabling the policy and now my container run as root because. I don't have time to look into this issue. Uh, there are different configurations and different levels of what you should be able to change. And uh, I think the platform should be flexible enough, but also have a way of enforcing policies. So even if you uh, you change, you click all the buttons and you 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 made your deployment very unsecure, something should you know tell you block you yep. later on like there are great tools in the ecosystem that can do that even before your application gets on kubernetes you can do it uh, as a static analysis in your pull request uh, that just scans your deployments and say hey you've set this deployment to run as root that's <laughs> not okay all right yeah. uh so yeah, yeah policies is is a um, is an important aspect of any kind of platform uh, even if you buy a platform or you build it you should be looking into how you can enable policy and enforce uh, policies in, and it's not only about security i i think policies should also address resilience right if yeah, you for sure i think yeah we're seeing a great use of policy for um best practices like I think policy kind of got maybe a, not a bad rap, but that got associated with compliance and regulation and all this kind of stuff. But the truth is that um, even just having a policy that says like you need to have resource and limits set on your pods, right? That has nothing to do with compliance, but it has a lot to do with keeping your app stable, right? Um, and you know I think that's that is an area that we're seeing more and more use of in these defining of these platforms is. And again, I think it's not just about um it's not about trying to force developers it's actually enabling them to think about less right like they don't necessarily have to remember all this stuff they don't have to have a checklist in their head of i need to do all these things policy sort of helps i say it's like the guardrails on a mountain road right you get to drive faster because there's a guardrail not because you know you're going to crash into it but just because you have that extra safety factor if you do yeah i think setting good defaults is one of the most important thing when you do the standardization, right? Let's say what most people do, they create this a Helm chart, right? And in, in the Helm chart, there are no defaults. You have to set your security context. You have to set resource and limits. You have to set all these things. Why not make, uh, you know, uh, 
set some good defaults there so people don't have to think about it. If, if their app doesn't run correctly, they will notice in the, I don't know, test environment yeah. and they then they get to fine tune these things, but you should always set good defaults. And I've seen there is a trend now with policy where you can actually set these defaults at the admission control of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes yeah. has this thing where you create a deployment, the deployment has no resource, the deployment has no limits, uh, but you can actually inject them based on, I don't know, some uh, conditions, some labeling based on what namespace they end up. So you can set all these good practices and defaults, even if it's not in the standardization of how you package the app, you can also do it at admission inside the Kubernetes cluster, which is very powerful. Yeah, I think it's sort of like the equivalent of, I mean, I always said it's like the equivalent of when something like VS Code added formatting on save. Like, I don't even think about formatting my code. I mean, I write terrible code now, right? Like, I write completely <laughs> ugly code, and then I hit save, and it's, like, beautiful, right? Like, I just don't even think about it. And I think that's that's a real benefit, too, is, like, uh, uh, you know, it, it makes me faster if I don't have to think about it, and I know that somebody, some other automation, even if I'm the one who configured the automation, is going to come along and, and, and do the right things for me. All right, so what do we think about when we're designing this platform? Um, you know, we kind of have the components of it. Um, what are we What are we thinking about when we when we're designing it? So I think the first step is to acknowledge that even if the platform is built everywhere, right? Uh, before you started, it's already there. Each team has their own scripts for deployment. Maybe they someone builds Helm charts, someone builds I don't know. They have good Docker files, whatever, right? All these pieces everywhere are the platform. So someone has to own the, the platform project. And in order to unify that, you actually have to create a team. You can name it the platform team, but someone has to own, especially at the beginning, and, and drive, be the driving force uh, to consolidation and, uh, and all of that. Um, the second step is, of course, identifying all the parties involved in the delivery pipeline. That's that's very important. You don't have to take into account only technical people, everybody. You should know the whole yep. the whole aspect of, of that. Um, and yep. I think after you describe your, your process, how are we going to do this delivery? Then you can go into Kubernetes, pick up uh, the components that you need, define infrastructure, blueprints, and all of that. But the human aspect, the uh, the first one is very, very important. Yeah. In my yeah. opinion. I mean, I think even of like one of the things that we've built into our deployment platform um, is uh, like a big red button, which basically is like, I want to stop all deployments, right? It's it's Black Friday. It's we're going to do a conference. It's whatever it is. Like we all know that deploying code is the easiest way to cause an outage. Right. Like that is that is the truth. Right. And sometimes you just want to stop every team from being able to deploy code. Right. And you don't want to have to go to every team and be like, could you please stop? And here's the window. And like it's work for them. It's work for it's it's painful for everybody. And so even just having that ability in the platform, it's a totally human thing. But to be able to hit that button and just say, like, we're stopping. We're not doing anything. We're not deploying any code for two weeks or whatever. it Well, hopefully it's not two weeks, but whatever that time period is, is. It's a human factors thing, but it's a huge, it's a huge value. And then the other side, I'd say, and I don't, I don't know if you've seen this on the human side, is, um, you know, the people who are out there selling to our customers, they want to know when a particular feature is going to get to a particular region where their particular customer is, right? And so if you can give them that dashboard in the platform that says like, here is where you're at in the release process, um, they don't have to ask us. They know they do a better job talking to the customer. Um, so I think there's a lot of that human factor stuff that goes into to, to designing that platform. Um, yeah, I think that's part of the observability part. And observability is not though only about telemetry. It should also be about what software are you running in your platform. You should have like this unified software bill of materials, right? Not just I'm running these app, apps. Well, those apps yeah, yeah. are are definitely importing hundreds and hundreds of packages from upstream, from open source projects, right? You should be able to, to look somewhere and, and see all, all these things. And of course, you should also have observability into the, um, 
deployment of pipeline and see, oh, okay, this region is uh, this version, this other region is this version. And uh, that's part of the UI aspect, right? I, I, I wrote in the other um, uh, slide that you should have um, self-service APIs. Well, it's not only about APIs. APIs are great and, and are a requirement for building a UI, but at some point, even if you, you say you don't need a UI, you, you definitely need something, maybe read-only, but that yeah, yeah. gives you that overlook, right? So you don't have to call all these APIs on your own and, and, and so on. For sure. Yeah, I mean, or even just visualizing, right? Like one of the things we've done for our DRIs is just give them a visual, a timeline visualization of when did each deployment happen that they can then effectively mm -hmm. overlay with a metrics. They're like, oh, I see there's a spike in errors here. And I see that there's a deployment of this microservice here. You know, I wouldn't necessarily have thought they were correlated, but because they're correlated, because I can visually see that they're correlated, I'm going to go investigate that thing, right? And I think you're absolutely right. Like there is no, I, I'm all about declarative for deployment, and but like there's a reason we use monitors and not and pictures and not just command line tools for all the stuff that we do, right? Like the, there's value in the visualization. Um, and yeah, yeah. One, one thing we we did in the Flux project, we integrate it with uh, Grafana notations, and every time Flux does a pull and an apply, we annotate all the graphs in Grafana. So when you look at your I don't know, business metrics or whatever, you see there, oh, this uh, tag is now deployed. So you see, oh, this is version 2.0. Maybe that's why the CPU has spiked and the memory is off the roof. Yeah, Maybe. yeah, yeah. For sure, that marker for sure. is so uh, important. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that the other thing that, that's on the bottom here is just another really, really valuable piece of advice for anybody out there who's starting to sort of get their feet wet in production uh, in producing one of these platforms, which is, I think there's a real tendency. We, we're all in technology. We love technology. Um, we like the cool stickers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's a tendency to like throw the kitchen sink at your platform. And uh, they kind of make sure that you, for that CNCF landscape that has, I don't know how many logos on it now, you know, you've sort of checked off each one. Um, like it's like a merit badge or something. Um, but don't do that, right? Like, like be very clear, every component that you add into your platform, be very clear about what the benefit is and what the cost is in terms of can you secure it? Can you update it if there's a CVE? Do you can you operate it if it doesn't work? Um, you know, I think we have to shift from thinking that each component we add to our platform is a new cool thing to thinking each component we add to our platform is a potential liability. Right? I mean, like we had I went through that same mental model when we talked about software dependency earlier, right? I went from a world of five years ago being like cool NPM whatever, right, to now being like okay, what bad actors am I inviting into my code by installing this dependency, right? Um, and I think, you know, I don't think there's bad actors necessarily in, in the components of your platform, but there are there is a operations liability and a security liability that comes with each piece. So start simple, know that it's gonna evolve anyway, platform's gonna change, everything changes. Um, and so anticipate that you can add things as you need them instead of having to have them in there at the start. Yeah, definitely. So, so like when we think about that, then, then what do we think about in terms of like delivering the application? Um, and so we've got our platform. Now we're going to deploy code into it. Yeah, so before we get to piece together our platform, we I think we need to put on paper uh, the delivery process of each application or each group of applications. Uh, it really depends on the scale that you are running, but things are very clear. Not all apps are the same. Some apps are critical for your business needs, for your, I don't know, whatever the product offers, and some are not in the critical path, right? And how I think that decisions should be made is by defining some service level objectives, right? And you can group apps based on that and create separate delivery processes. Maybe for something that's highly critical, you want to go through dev staging test, you want to keep it running for a very long time just with 10% of your users using the new version and so on. But for other components which are not critical, maybe you don't want to wait five days to deliver a patch. So 
it's it's quite important to group them based on I, I'm suggesting here service level objectives, but there are so many other ways of how you can um, structure them. Um, but Re revenue, I see a lot of people. Revenue is the big thing, right? Where it's like, this is my logistics app, and if it goes down, I can't sell anything. That's my, you know, like if that other thing goes down, well, like maybe people get laptops a day later for internal users, and like there's a big difference between, you know, the 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 business criticality, I guess, of of yeah. what the particular apps are. And and um, another important part in the delivery process are humans. Like we usually think of delivery process as a totally automated process. It, it runs on its own, it's continuous, humans are not there. But as you said, that red button that has to stop everything, I don't know, don't deploy Fridays or whatever. Uh, so every every step in the uh, in the process, you should consider, should I make this step optional? Can a human intervene here? Can someone do a rollback, even if all the metrics are okay, even if the application is green, but maybe there is a business decision to delay some future or whatever. So your delivery process should take into consideration human intervention at every step. Uh, I'm not saying it like at gates, human gates everywhere, but allow that possibility uh, if you can. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think there's always that case where either your testing doesn't catch it, but you see that there's a problem or, you know, I always say like, you never know when somebody, you know, somebody's gonna be out demoing your thing and you just don't wanna do a rollout while, uh, you know, while somebody's doing a demo. Uh, so, <laughs> cool. So before we even think about like delivering code out to production, um, you know, what are the pieces that people are thinking about as they go from, you know, the thing on the, on the code on the disk to the container image that's uh, that's ready to push. Um. Yeah, before we even get to Kubernetes, we have to build our apps and package them in a container uh, image. And that process can be very simple. You throw there a Docker file, you do a Docker build. Um, but Given the fact that you know your app is made out of so many external components, you should think very careful about this initial step, which is very critical to the security of your whole system, right? It really depends what what kind of packages are you installing on uh, on the base operating system in the um, in the container. Uh, so maybe you should look into creating attaching a software bill of materials. To your container image, and recently, for example, Docker, Docker Build Kit has such a feature now. It's, it's not perfect; it will not create the perfect S bomb, but it's a start. And if you don't, if you have nothing today, you should enable that, <laughs> right? And another important part is provenience. You, when you look at a container image, you should be able to tell when was this built, on which machine, and what tools were involved in creating this image, right? And this helps you discover, uh, you know, CVs that there, there was no public CV when you build the image, but maybe two days later, there is a major CV there and you, you should be aware that through the provenience file, oh, I used this software to build this uh, image and that software was compromised, right? Maybe I should revert it, uh, get it out of the production system. Yeah, I think there's even stuff you should shift left. Like one of the things we've, you know, we've done is um, shifting left with things like from tags in your Docker file, right? I think people are like, oh, I got a private registry. I built my image. I pushed it to my private registry. I'm good to go. And you're like, well, that's great. But what was the base image that you built from, right? And if that base image is like random user at Docker Hub, you should probably be thinking very carefully about whether you want to support crypto mining, basically. Um, you know, um, and I think that's that's the other piece of it is that because we're going to these declarative formats, not just for our applications, but for defining how the application is packaged together, we can start doing a bunch of the shift left stuff that we would typically have thought of as being associated with code to our application package as well. I can now say, look, you have to have a from image. Like I've got these six blessed from images. You can start there. And that's it. 
Okay, and I'm not going to let your Docker file even check in if you're if you're coming from a different from image. Um, and I can even go through and look for, you know, I can assemble. It's great that Docker has the SWAM stuff in it, but I can look for things like apt. And I can you know, see that you're installing, you're running a script to install apt or you are, you know, running NPM and I can actually extract the packages that you're installing from that Docker file. So I think it, even before we start building the image there's a bunch that we can do to kind of keep track and keep a handle on exactly what's going in. Um, Cause I do think that there's this like somewhere along in the container cloud native world, we forgot that like downloading random binaries from the internet is a bad idea. Um, and somehow Docker pull like made us forget that. So, um, but I think we're getting it back. Like we're, we're starting to realize like, oh yeah, this is actually something we need to pay attention to. Um, yeah, I've seen uh, in the last two years, a lot of, you know, going back to the basic of building images and there are many projects there out there and organizations who are trying to, you know, make this process as safe as possible. Um, yeah. And, and I think the other thing is we've seen as well is like going towards things like um, reduced package images, right? You, you start from a bun, you know, let's say an Ubuntu or anything else, the standard traditional Linux. There's a lot of packages in that image that you might not be using, but that might trigger CVEs. You might be triggered, but might trigger CVEs, right? In your scanning. And the more noise, what we found is the more noise in your image scanning, where someone's like, oh, yeah, that's a vulnerability, but we don't ever use that tool. Um, it just makes figuring out if you're actually secure harder, right? So reducing the number of packages going to like a distroless image or other kinds of like reduced, I mean, if you're in Go, maybe even just a pure scratch image, uh, stat, any, you know, static binary language helps you make sure that like when there is a CV scan, the CVs are really about your application and not about, you know, like image, some image magic binary that's sitting happens to be sitting on your uh you know your image but is never actually used by your by your application yeah i mean <clears throat> it also depends on which programming language you are using if it's yeah. go rust or things that <clears throat> can be built statically are way more suitable to use from scratch or from alpine with no package no nothing not even the shell installed Right. But for others, for interpret languages, you have to rely on OS packages. You have to have OpenSSL uh, installed there or libssh and, and all of that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, but instead of installing the whole dev suite and getting every single tool, only install the certs and only OpenSSL the client, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you don't need the whole suite, right? So it's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of stuff unneeded there that, uh, just is there to to be exploited in a way. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great bridge to to thinking about security in general, right? Um, because I think when people are thinking about uh, images, there's been a lot of focus lately in the cloud native space on image signing. Um, but I think there's just so much more to the broader problem. Because um, like the truth is that if you sign an image that has bad software in it, in it, and your signature's not doing much, right? Um, and so one of the things that we've been I've been really excited about lately, we put on a, a lot of our projects is Dependabot, which is, you know will come along and um, uh, do a pull request to update your dependencies in GitHub. Um, but I think in general, getting things in that that PR, this kind of comes back to the GitOps thing. It's like the more you can get stuff to just be, I pressed a button, it merged a pull request, and then magic happened and it deployed. Like the faster you're going to get to um, you know, people being patched and secure, right? Like, I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, pressing a button to merge a pull request is just way lower barrier to entry than somebody editing the same equivalent files, right? Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we adopted the Dependabot and CodeQL in Flux and it was, especially CodeQL was really, really, a uh, really yeah. nice. Um, CodeQL is super cool. I mean, like I was a little bit skeptic when I turned it on, and it immediately found a security bug in my code. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like we're gonna turn this on everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's amazing. Um, what it, and it's what free it for uh, for any public uh, request. Yeah. It's all free, and 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 it is actually also community. Like the a lot of the rules in there are. Um, 
you know, community sourced, um, which is kind of cool as well. I think, again, it comes back to the value of having people come together in the ecosystems to produce kind of a unified set uh, set of best practices. Um, so I think, you know, we're the, the next thing I was really thinking about was like, what is the, what are the pieces of Kubernetes that we should be thinking about in this platform? Like, what do we, what does Kubernetes offer? What do we need to add? How do we figure out in this, you know, I joke about the CNCF landscape being an eye chart, um, but there's like, I don't know how many projects in that slide now. Uh, so how do we figure out like what what are the right ones to do? It's it's a tough process, right? You so you define your delivery processes, and from there you can extract the futures that you want, right? Um, we serve uh, applications to end users, and that has to go over the internet, right? So I have to expose my application on the internet. So from that requirement comes. Uh, materializes itself into I need an ingress controller on Kubernetes, right? So first you have to identify the the futures, but for every single future you have in the CNCF landscape a gazillion options, right? There are so many ingress controllers out there, so many CNIs, everything, service meshes, and so on, right? Um, there is no way around it. If you are building your own platform, you have to put effort into it and you have to understand these tools, do your own benchmark, make your own decisions. That's one way. Another way is trust someone else <laughs> with that recommendation. I know if you are uh, an Azure customer, I bet Azure has opinions and I know it supports some of the CNIs, it can offer support for, for some of them. and in a way it makes choosing easier because you'll be choosing something that you can get support on and you don't have to maintain it on your own, but not all things are supported, right? Uh, uh, there are so many components out there or future sets of Kubernetes that you want and no cloud will support it. I don't know, uh, uh, weird things around the uh, networking and all that stuff. So at some point you have to put something there uh, and you have to understand what you are installing in Kubernetes, like Kubernetes add-ons, we call it CRD controllers or controllers or operators. These things are extending Kubernetes and you have to think that once you have deployed such a controller, you have to take care of its life cycle the same way you do with Kubernetes upgrades and so on. And being a controller, being something at the heart of Kubernetes is very tied to Kubernetes versioning, how Kubernetes functions, and so on. So um, the more components you add to your cluster, you have more futures, but the greater the maintenance burden is. So think very yep. carefully uh, before you install, uh, I don't know, CNI, service mesh, ingress, load balancer, all of that just to, you know, uh, expose a simple app uh, on the outside. You may not For need. Sure advanced CNI or, uh, I don't know, service meshes uh, for simple things. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's, I've, I've always said like the um, the best thing you can choose is the thing that someone else will run for you. Okay. Right? You know, and uh, so I think that's, yeah, that, that, and I think it's, again, like sometimes we as engineers don't always love making decisions that way, right? Like we want to use the thing that is the coolest or the thing that, you know, uh, we find the most intriguing or is written in a language that we like. Um, but the truth is that like the ability to call someone up and say it's broken, please fix it, is just worth way more uh, than, 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 than anything else. Um, so when we're thinking about all these different Kubernetes, I think we sort of talk a lot about the context of a single, um, single cluster, but the truth is that actually there's a lot of clusters. We talked about staging and production earlier. Um, but like, how should how should we be thinking? What do you think about when we're thinking about um, you know the various environments that we might be uh, deploying to? So I think one of the most important things of your platform is the fact that it should abstract away and all the infrastructure complexity of setting up an environment. You should be able to say, I want a new test environment, and you shouldn't have to install all the things, create the cluster from scratch and so on. 
so I think it's important for a platform to offer env environments as a service. I don't know if you could, if it's feasible to do that for um, production environments, but you should definitely be able to, you know, onboard a new uh, team member in your uh, dev team. They should be able to get their own test cluster or uh, dev cluster or whatever without putting them through all the burden of creating one from scratch. Yeah, so, we actually, we actually, I mean, at the extreme, I mean, you said maybe it's not possible for production, but like at the extreme, we actually had have customers who do blue green Kubernetes, right? Like they, they, they do blue green deployment, but they turn up an entirely new cluster, install all the software, test it, and then tear down last week's cluster. And they do that on a weekly cadence, right? And that's, I think, the power of the cloud at some level is that yeah. you can do that with an API, right? Um, and the great thing about that is, like, you're practicing your failover, you're practicing your your like disaster recovery every single week. Yeah, and I, I think here GitOps helps a lot in creating almost identical clusters uh, yeah. because you. Basically, it's a it's a directory in a in a in a Git repo where you have there all the Kubernetes add-ons, everything is is in there, right? So if you make small changes with I don't know customize overlay or with some templating or whatever, you can change the load balancer uh, uh, name or you can change the DNS name and so on, and you can you know easily create an identical, almost identical cluster next to the one you have and yeah, that's that's a great first step to achieving blue green deployments in production. Uh, but I think uh, from a platform perspective, you should start with being able to have test environments or dev environments fast and work from from there towards uh, yeah, yeah being able to to replace production uh, in a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I think that that brings up another um, discussion which is related, which is then how do you perform the rollout across these various environments, whether it's into multiple dev environments or into staging environments, you need to upgrade your monitoring or whatever it happens to be. Clearly, lasting changes to the entire world all at once is a bad idea. Um, we've all uh, we've all been there and caused some outages, but yeah, you know, we've learned our lessons. Um, so like, how should we, you know, what is how what is the GitOps way of, of doing staged rollout? There are many ways of skinning again. <laughs> um, yeah, so the the GitOps way because it's everything is declarative. You you basically have to have some automation that moves changes from one uh, declaration to another, right? So in a in a really sim simplistic way of doing it, you have two deployments files. One is for your uh, test staging environment. One is for your production environment. You change only the staging one. Then you know uh, Flux or whatever is there picks it up, deploys it, runs the tests for it, and only when the tests are okay, then it can open a pull request and say, "I'm moving this change now to the this next file, and I'm bumping the version there." After someone approves it, only then it goes to production. Um, but that's a simplistic approach, right? Because production maybe is not only a single cluster, maybe are more than one cluster, one per region, and, and, and so on. And at some point, you need some kind of orchestrator on top of, uh, of the promotion pipeline that understands that, you know, a rollout to production may fail, but maybe you shouldn't roll back. Because mm -hmm. if from yeah. three regions, only one region fails, is, is, is better to freeze it there and fix it and, and go forward and roll back everything. So yep. you can't have like this single solution that works for everything. It's it's very tailor made to uh, how uh, business critical is the app that you are deploying on how many cluster you are doing it. But um, with, with Flux and Argo and other uh, GitHub solutions, there are basically two ways of, of orchestrating this. You either have a management cluster where from there, everything goes to all the other clusters or you install the GitOps agent on each single cluster and then you control everything only through the Git repository. Yeah. Uh, there are two approaches. 
they aren't perfect. Neither one. I don't like the idea of having this management cluster because in my mind that becomes a single point of failure. You have yeah, still yeah. another cluster that you have to maintain and so on. But for many organizations, that's the solution because they want this, you know, single entity that can actually drive changes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've seen a lot of people with with GitOps on AKS. We've seen a lot of people use uh, tag based workflows where they manipulate tags in the repo. Um, I think it always scares me when people, when you said like the intro, it scares me a little bit to have multiple copies of a file because I've seen so many cut and paste or weird, you know, like I remembered to fix it in one place, but I didn't remember to put it in another place. Um, so I think that I, it was good in Flux too, actually to see the customized work come in so that you could really have one file and then if you need to change the database name or if you need to change some small piece of it, be able to adjust it like that. Um, so then the characteristics of application rollout, um, you know, I think are all designed around this idea that, you know, we're delivering global applications out to the world. Um, you know, the Azure Kubernetes service is present in like 60 different regions and more every every quarter around the world. Um, but we've made this promise that failures have to be local, right? And otherwise, who you know, people can't rely on you. Um, and you just mentioned this sort of like, when do you decide to roll back? Um, and and then also like the fact that every single change you ever make could break something, right? I, I, we went through a long list um, of various reasons we've broke, how things have been broken, but it feels to me like every single time we think we've found every possible way to break an application, we find a new way to break an application. Um, so like given all of that, like how do we how do we do the actual orchestration? We've got the mechanism, whether it's tags or a manager or cluster, but like what what should what what should people what do you think people should be thinking about as they do put their rollouts together? I think they should look really well at the app and observe how the app behaves when it gets deployed. For example, can you run multiple versions of the same app on the same cluster using the same database? Can you roll back an upgrade. Uh, there are all sorts of dependencies in, in the deployment pipeline. For example, the, the most usual one is uh, you do database migration, saying your new version of the app runs the migration and it renames some columns. And after the app runs a little bit, it fails. It has some bugs and you want to roll back. Well, surprise, the old version does not work because you have renamed the columns or you have removed columns altogether. So you are not able to roll back. You have to manually, I don't do a database restore. You lose the data. It's, it gets so, so complicated. So I think it's, it's, it's very critical to think about all these dependencies and make at least two versions, one after the other, backwards compatible with their data stores, caching, all the other dependencies. If you can do that, you'll really have a hard time, no matter if you are using Kubernetes serverless, it doesn't matter, right? You'll still hit this issue. Um, yeah. And practice it too, I would say also, like, cause even if you think you can roll back, you know, we do things like roll forward in Canary and then roll back and then roll forward again, um, just to practice it. Right, just to make sure that you haven't introduced some new database or some new file format or some new whatever it is that that you thought you had done it, but you, you're now broken, right? Um, yeah, uh, another aspect is around configuration. Like most people think that only code changes can produce bad effects and that's where the bugs are because I'm working on my code and so on. Uh, I, I've been working on Flagger, which is a continuous delivery uh, tool, part of the Flux project, which does canary deployments, A-B testing, and so on. And early on, people uh, notice like, hey, it's okay, Flagger can detect changes in my app version, but I, I change something in a config map, that value in the config map mounted as a environment variable for my app. My app went insane because that variable is wrong and couldn't understand right. and crash loop and so on. Uh, and now Flagger treats config changes, be it in secrets or config map, as code changes. It does a canary analysis and, and all of that. And, and I think it's important to 
treat code and config changes as a whole. And there are sure. there are some ideas in in this direction uh, in CNCF and and with the um, Open uh, Container uh, Group, where what we really want to achieve is to be able to create these OCI artifacts that holds your code as in the container image, but also your configuration. So when you deploy something, you have configuration along with code and that can be tested together and see and deliver as a single package and versioned uh, in a single way. So you don't have like my config version and my code version. Uh, now you have to match them and so on, which is, yeah. It's a tough problem to solve, but I think with OCI artifacts, we are getting close on on, on solving this uh, at the packaging level, at least. Yeah, no, I'm really excited. Actually, a lot of the work on OCI artifacts has actually been driven out of one of my teams, and uh, we're really excited, actually, about the things you can do um, with OCI artifacts. I think you're exactly right. I feel like one of the things that we didn't quite get right in the design of Kubernetes early on was integrating config map into deployment more tightly right like config map is kind of a byproduct of the fact that you have a pod template in there but it's not really like it's not a first order thing um and uh i do think that having the tighter association between config and code is is uh is the right way to go about doing that additionally i think we're going to see this with um ml a lot uh, with ai as well right where people are going to want to ship images and models and they probably are going to want to rev them independently, right? Um, but you're going to run into exactly the same problems of like my code expects a certain AI model, and my AI model is a different model than what my code expects. And you know, either it doesn't work correctly and it crashes, or maybe it even just gives bad data back. Um, so I think this is going to be an area that we're going to have to have to do a bunch more uh, in the future. Um, yeah. Well, I think. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. One, one, one second, I want to conclude here about OCI artifacts. So there is a new API specification, which is called references, um, which has landed in uh, OCI 1.1, where you have now a way to say, this image references this other uh, layer in the registry, which is the config, which references this yep. other stuff, which is the machine uh, learning model and, and so on. So exactly. we are, getting closer to to having um, this yeah. year next year tools that will will address this aspect yeah. and we in the flux project we we integrate a lot with oci and um, it's our focus for the future yeah for sure and i think it's going to even i mean my guess is it will even actually extend to some of the base image stuff that we were talking about where you could even imagine saying like i'm going to have a base java jdk image and i might actually attach my jar as an artifact not necessarily as a layer that I put right on top. Because like at some level, the JDK image is something that someone else produced and my jar file or my war file or whatever is gonna be something that I produced. It becomes a little mm -hmm. bit more like a build pack or like a yeah. PaaS kind of environment. And I think that's a really good step forward. I think that container images have been great, but they are, they kind of assume that the developer owns the entire container image. And in many cases well, actually, layers. All the layers, exactly. So they sort of assume that the developer owns all the layers. And I think what we see in practice is actually it's like an app team or a platform team that owns a lot of the layers. And then the developer owns just like the last layer. And that's really unclear in, in the container image as it stands. It makes it harder to like have a central team push an update. Like if you know that there's a vulnerability in your JDK image, you suddenly have to talk to all of the other teams and get them to rebuild their images and it's very painful you can set up ci cd to do it but it's painful yeah. right and i think it's because we don't have that ability to say here's one thing and here's a different thing and they come together but they're not smashed together so yeah so you could patch only the base image replace only that or exactly you patch the base the image but the jar yeah and, and the jar <laughs> or yeah you could do, do either one and i think that's going to really help um people people manage a lot of this stuff in uh, uh, production a little bit better, where you might be able to even centrally man, like you could centrally patch something like log4j without uh, talking to every single application team, maybe. Right? Like that's sort of the goal. Right? Yeah. First, um, you need so. to find that log4j. First, you need to find it. So you need the S-bomb to find it, and then you need to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. Well, we're pretty much out of time, I think. Yeah. Um, so. 
what do we so what do we think in closing oh if you build your platform <laughs> if you go on to that journey <clears throat> i think yeah you should be really really careful of what you're choosing and if you can choose a managed service you should be doing that of course it's it's also a business decision right you're uh, uh, you also have to take into consideration costs and everything, but on the long run, I think the more managed services you get into our platform, the easier it will be for you to maintain it. But if you go, you know, bare metal and everything it's on you, then you have to be very conscious that you need a team on the long run. You need a lot of maintenance and platforms evolve. Like everything that's in CNCF landscape changes all the time. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, the CNI you deploy today will not be the CNI you deploy tomorrow. For sure, and I think I think that you know it's it's easy when you get a price sheet to know what a managed service costs. It's a lot harder to understand the maintenance and engineering costs of owning it yourself. And I think it's incumbent on us, um, people who are developing platforms, so to to be clear with with everybody about like it's going to cost you, right? Like open source is not free like beer. It's much more free like puppy. Um, and uh, so you should expect that you're going to have to do some work or you're going to, you know, in many cases, it's actually more efficient choice to use a managed service in a public cloud or with, a, you know, a, an ISV like Weaveworks. Um, and I think the other piece we said is like, you know, maybe the corollary is every component that you pull into your platform, it's adding cost. It's either adding literal cost or it's adding time that you're going to have to use to patch it and maintain it and operate it um, and potentially reliability issues too. So be very careful and embrace the change that, that Stefan was mentioning and realize that if you need a component, you can always add it later. And, um, so I hope that was useful for everybody. Um, and you can reach me out on Twitter or GitHub at Brendan D. Burns. I'm Stefan Prodan on Twitter and on GitHub. Uh, it was great talking to you, Brandon. Uh, had fun. Absolutely. So hopefully people will, will get something out of it. <laughs> All right. For sure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.